Welcome, everyone. Um, if you don't know me, my name's Leah. I'm the president of the GMU Economic Society. Um, on behalf of the Econ Society, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. The GMU Econ Society is a student-run organization. We're committed to advancing the understanding of economics all across campus. If you're interested in learning more, please come talk to me after the event, or we also have a sign-up sheet in the back where you can just put down your name and email, and we'll add you to our mailing list, and hopefully you'll be able to get involved with us. Um, also, if you're here for a class, we have a sign-up sheet um, in the back for your class, just with your professor's name, the time, and which class it is, to so make sure to sign up so we can give them to your professors. And finally, we'd like to thank the Future Freedom Foundation for co-hosting this event with us. It really would not be possible to have this event without them. And we're very thankful. This is the second installment. We have another one in November and three more um, in the upcoming spring. So just we'll send out the information about them um, as we get them all figured out with the dates. And I'd like to introduce you guys to Bart Frazier with the FFF. Hello again. Uh, I'll keep my uh, remarks short here so we can get underway. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the Future Freedom Foundation, uh, we're a nonprofit libertarian educational foundation. Uh, and if you want to check us out, go to our website, fff.org. Uh, that's where we have everything that we do is on the website. All the videos from this lecture series you can watch for free. We have literally thousands of articles on there uh, from two decades of publishing. Uh, and we also have a free internet newsletter uh, you can sign up for out in the lobby on the table there. It's free for the asking. And also, actually, uh, all of the literature that's on that table is free for the taking. Anything on the table you can take as well. Um, so please do. Uh, a few notes for housekeeping. We have a social hour at Brian's Grill. It's right across the street um, at the corner of 123 and Braddock Road. Please join us if you can. Uh, and also we have uh, our upcoming talks next month on November 15th. We have uh, Jeffrey Myron, an economist from Harvard. Uh, and in the spring, with dates yet to be determined, we have David Bernstein, Tom Palmer, and Lawrence White coming. Uh, the topic for tonight uh, is law and economics. And for those students in the crowd here, uh, you guys are really lucky. You guys have a world-class uh, economics department here, and you also have a, a top-notch law school as well, and it's, it's a nice combination, and uh, you really, uh, you couldn't do better than uh, the gentleman who's going to speak tonight, uh, Don Boudreau. Uh, he is professor of economics here at GMU. He is the former chair. Uh, he was previously president of the Foundation for Economic Education, was associate professor of legal studies at Clemson. Um, he earned his PhD from Auburn and his law degree from UVA. He's been published in the Wall Street Journal, Investor's Business Daily, Regulation, Reason, Ideas on Liberty, many others. Uh, and he published uh, Globalization in 2008. And he has a blog with Russ Roberts called Cafe Hayek. Uh, his talk tonight is entitled Liberty, Legislation, and Law. Uh, please welcome Don Boudreau. How are you? I want to thank uh, the Econ Society and uh, FFF, Bumper, and, and Bart for sponsoring my talk and having me here. It's a pleasure to be with you. I think the reason Bumper and, and Bart invited me is because they have a social hour afterwards. They're looking for speakers to drive the audience to drink. <laughs> I hope I'll do that, <clears throat> although not too, qui not too quickly. I don't want you rushing out you know, to, to, go, uh, to go drink too early. Um, the Topic tonight is indeed uh, law, uh, legislation, and liberty. That's a title, as some of you know, of what I regard to be uh, F.A. Hayek's greatest book. It was a book written toward the end of his life. It was a three-volume work, uh, first volume published in 73, second in 76, the third in 79. And I think it contains some of the most profound insights, way beyond economics, way beyond just law, but insights into the way society works. And so practically everything that I say here tonight, I will confess, is derivative of what's in that book. Hayek influenced me so much, it's hard for me to tell any longer what ideas I have on my own or from other scholars and what ideas come from Hayek, because so many of them come either directly or indirectly from the late F.A. Hayek. Um, I actually have a prop tonight. 
Um, if, the, if it had been more crowded, the prop would work better, but, but, but I think it'll work. So I'm gonna, let, let me ask you to do me a favor. Would you, would you give me that button that's right over there? Thanks. Before I, before I change, I'm just talking to the microphone. This was, my, this was my prop. Before I came up here, I put these books and my coat on that chair, and I noticed that no one sat in that chair. That prop, my books on that chair, actually demonstrates the principal point that I want to make tonight. I don't want to necessarily convince you that my conception or definition of law is the correct one. I just want to share with you the way I think about law and, and hopefully stimulate your thoughts along these lines. I think I'm right, but, but I don't know. I once had a great teacher at NYU, Fritz Machlup, who, uh, who said in class one day, he says that uh, he's sure that 50% of what he knows is wrong. He just doesn't know which 50% it is. Fritz Machlup was a lot smarter than me, so I'm sure that, I don't know, 75% of what I know is, is wrong. I just don't know which 75% it is. So I think I'm right, but I, I, could, I could be wrong. Um, but here's my point. Um, my books on that chair prevented someone from sitting in that chair. It's very possible that someone came by, maybe you, what's your name? Carissa. Carissa. Maybe you would have sat in that chair had the books not been on that chair. But you all know it's just a norm in society. If you go into a college uh, cafeteria at, at lunch time when it's crowded, you go into an auditorium when it's crowded, and if you want a seat, how do you reserve a seat? You take your books, you take a coat, or you take some other personal item that you're not too worried about getting stolen, uh, and you place it on the table or on the chair, and what that does, what the placement of those items does, is to reserve that chair for you. It's an unwritten rule, but it's an unwritten rule that I think is properly called law. It's an instance of law. I'll get back to that example in, in just a moment. So what I want to discuss with you this evening is a conception of law um, that I believe is among the most uh, destructive misconceptions that modern people have. It is a conception of law as something that is not only designed and centrally planned, but also centrally imposed. And this misconception is captured nowhere as firmly as in, in the common practice that we all know of referring to legislators as lawmakers. I cannot hear a legislator, either a you know, congressman, a parliamentarian in Britain, a, a state legislator, a city councilman referred to as a lawmaker without it being, for me, like fingernails on a chalkboard. It just <clears throat> grates me, right? Because the way I think of law, and it's a very Hayekian way, but the way I think of law is law is, is in fact not legislation. Legislation is not law. The two are very different. So legislators are legislation makers, but they are not lawmakers in any sense of the term. And the fact that we think of legislators as being lawmakers, the fact that we think of legislation as law, I believe creates a profound danger in modern society because we wind up giving the respect that genuine law does deserve and should command to something that's not law but called law that in many instances I believe is actually uh, 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 instances of, of, of horrible law breaking. So back to the books on the, on the uh, chair. By my putting the books on the chair, I reserved that spot for me. It's not written down anywhere. You can't go to the student handbook at GMU or to the bylaws of the Econ Society or the Future Freedom Foundation. You can't go to the general statutes of Virginia or the Supreme Court of Virginia. You can't go to the Constitution of the US or the UN General Assembly's whatever the US, uh, UN General Assembly has. You can't find the law written down anywhere that books placed on a chair in a crowded auditorium or in a crowded cafeteria reserve it. But it's a rule that's respected. I mean, think about it. If you walk into a cafeteria, excuse me, 
you walk into a cafeteria and you want to sit down to eat, but you didn't place your books at a spot, and you see a, a place where no one is sitting, and you walk over there and then you see books in front of it, what do you normally do? You walk away, you're disappointed, you want to sit down, but you don't sit down because someone's books are there. Now, you could break the law, you could push the books aside and sit down, but you know you'd be doing wrong. You know you'd be breaking some norm. And to get ahead of myself, maybe, yes, I'm defining law as, as, a, as coming from a norm. I'll, get, I'll use this example later to explain how I think more formal law is developed out of this very simple example. Use it as a, as a case for other instances of law. But everyday experience should teach us that law and legislation are not the same thing. First, a great deal of what is legislation uh, is not followed, is simply ignored, and a great deal, as, I, as the books on the chair case makes clear, a great deal of what is law is not written down anywhere. Um, I'm going to ask a question, and I guess there's a very bright light, so I can't see you. You can see me, probably because of the very bright light, but I'm, I can't see you. But I'm going to ask a question. I want you to raise your hands anyway, and I'll pretend I can see you. Um, how many of you have ever driven, purposely driven, faster than the posted speed limit? <laughs> yes. Okay. Actually, I have someone in here. Is, it, is it my student in here who has not driven faster than the posted speed limit? What's that? Yeah, I can't see you, but I'm, yeah, yeah, I know, I see, okay, yeah. Um, I asked this question to a student of mine uh, the other day, and I was surprised by the answer. Well, now, all of you, if legislation is law, all of you are lawbreakers and should be punished. You know, there's no more clear legislation than a speed limit. It is literally black letter law, right? It's on, on a big white sign, and it says 5-5 five, five, MPH, right? and everybody in America, everybody who's English speaking knows what that means, 55 miles an hour, speed limit, 5-5 five, five MPH, do not drive faster than 55 miles per hour, and yet we all routinely do it. Now let me ask you to then imagine yourself driving along on a four-lane highway, the weather's fine, you know, you know, your car's in good operating conditions, it's a perfectly good driving day, and you, drive, you set your cruise control, the speed limit's 55, you set your cruise control on 60. Right. Driving along, you look in your rearview mirror, and you see, woo, 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 and you get pulled over. And the cop, you know, comes over and you know, throws up his sunglasses and says, all right, uh, uh, sir slash ma'am, uh, you know, you know what you were doing? You were doing 60 in a 55 mile an hour zone. What part of 55 miles an hour don't you understand? Right? <laughs> right. Now, how, imagine how you would feel. Just, just hold that imagination in your mind, in your psyche somewhere. Now, I'm going to give you a second scenario. And I want you to compare how you feel in the second scenario to how you feel in the first scenario that I just gave you. Second scenario is you're driving along same type of road, same conditions, Spe posted speed limit is 55 miles an hour, but you, you set your cruise control on 95, right? And you're driving along 95, and you look in your rearview mirror, and sure enough, cop pulls you over and says, you know, you're going 95 miles an hour, I'm gonna give you a speeding ticket. Now, imagine how you feel in that second case compared to the first. I'm, I'm just guessing here, I mean, we do introspection, I'm doing introspection how I would feel. In the second case, where I, was driving, where I was driving 95 miles per hour in a 55 mile an hour zone, I would, of course, feel disappointed that I got pulled over, but I wouldn't feel wronged. I wouldn't feel like some injustice has been visited upon me because I, was, I, I pulled over having uh, gone 95 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone. In the first case, I would feel not only disappointed that I got pulled over, I would feel wronged. I would feel that there was some injustice visited upon me, even though the speed at which I'm traveling is indeed five miles an hour above the posted maximum speed limit. And I suspect you'd feel the same way too. And the reason is because 55 miles an hour is not really the law when driving on 
an open highway, good weather with, uh, you know, under good driving conditions with a car in good operating order. The real law is eh, about, you know, 10, 9, 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. It's not stated anywhere. It's not written down in the statute book anywhere. But that is the law. In fact, when I drive in those conditions, I always set my, my, my uh, cruise control at about 9 miles an hour above. That's actually kind of conservative. So if it's a 55 mile an hour zone, I'm going along at 64. When I see cops on the, on the side of the road, even with the radar, I never slow down. I have never gotten pulled over. So even the cops recognize it as the law. The law is not 55. It's something greater than that. And you all know that because that's how most people drive. Relatedly, if you drive at 65 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone or 60 miles an hour, you don't feel as if you're some kind of social parasite. Right? I, I suspect, if you, I suspect, assuming you're not mentally unstable and, and, have, and have sociopathy, I suspect if you made your living uh, uh, through burglary or armed robbery, you'd feel like a social parasite. I mean, you, you, know, you might be, you know, you might make a good living doing it because you have a comparative advantage at, at ripping other people off in which case you should, maybe should go into politics. <laughs> but you'd probably feel parasitic. You, know, you kind of know that what you do is icky. Right? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, how many of you, after you, you know, come home at night after you know, driving you know, 38 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone, you, know, you, you feel icky. Ugh, I'll never do that again. You know, go, to go to church twice on Sunday <laughs> to confess that, that sin. So the law is not just what is written. I'm going to give you one other example. I'm going to read you a statute that's currently on the books. I just downloaded this today from the state of Massachusetts general laws. This is part four, which is entitled "Crimes, Punishments, and Pr uh, uh, Preceding Crim Crimes and Punishments in Criminal Cases." Title one: Crimes and Punishments, Chapter 272. Crimes Against Chastity, Morality, Decency, and Good Order. Section 18, Fornication. Here it is, Section 18. Whoever commits fornication shall be punished by imprisonment for not more than three months or by a fine of not more than $30. That's still in the books in, in, in Massachusetts. Right. And fornication defined as, as uh, consensual sex uh, among uh, adults who are not married to each other. Right. Now, so imagine this scenario, you know, you're, you're, you're 26, 27 years old, or, you know, over the age of 18, and you're in Massachusetts, and uh, I'm talking to the guys here, right? So, you, you know, you, 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 you're, you're really interested in a girl, right? And, and you finally get her to go out with you, you know, and you, you have what you think is a nice dinner, you go to a nice movie, and, you know, you, you take her home, and, and uh, you know, you, you kiss her a little bit, and you try to push things a little further, and then she says, oh, oh, she says, oh, oh, Montana. Uh, I'd love to, but it's against the law. See, now, if she does that, right, you know that you know your history. She's not going to see you anymore. It's not, it's not really against the law, right? It's on the statute books. It's on, and in three other states in the U.S., at least three other states, it's on the statute books. Consensual sex among adults is punishable as a criminal misdemeanor. That's not law. It's legislation. Let's drive the point home. Imagine, let's say, some overzealous Javert-like prosecutor decides to uh, enforce this law. Right? You know, I, I don't know. He's at home one night, and 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 hears his, uh, you know, his neighbor's 26-year-old daughter confessing to uh, living in sin with her boyfriend, and so he arrests them both. And they admit it. They actually admit to violating the sacred statute of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Well, yeah, yeah, we, we live and we actually sleep together. I mean, you know, like, sleep together, right? And so he says, all right, it's against the law. Section 18, blah, 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 I'm hauling you in, right? And you get asked to be on the jury. So you're panel and jury. And you know that if you vote to convict this person, this person will spend three months in jail and pay $30 in fines, all right? <laughs> would, would you convict? the person. Uh, well, I, 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 I wouldn't convict. I mean, even though it's written down here that it's against the law, you know as a jury it's not really against the law. 
What is the law then? Let me give you my definition of the law. Maybe should have given it to you earlier, but I wanted to keep you in suspense. I wanted to give you examples. Here's how I define the law, and I admit it's very broad, and it's what I want to defend in the rest of the time I have with you. Law is socially imposed constraints on behavior that emerge from ordinary, everyday human behaviors and that become embedded in widespread expectations. Law is socially imposed constraints on behavior that emerge from ordinary, everyday human behaviors and that become embedded in widespread expectations. Under this definition, law, first of all, is not defined as something that the government hands down. Law is not defined or confined by its method of enforcement. Some constraints, some behaviors are so horrible, violate human expectations so egregiously that they are, they are punished severely. Murder is the obvious example. You know, cold-blooded, first-degree murder is the obvious example. And so because it's such a horrible crime, and we can get into the law and economics of that, which I won't do, but you, it doesn't take a genius to figure out why it's so, so, excuse me, so socially destructive. It's a really horrible crime. We spend a lot of resources fighting it. Other crimes, violations of other, other crimes, are not so horrible. Other offenses against the law are not so horrible. If someone sat in that chair, and I really wanted to sit in it, then I, it's such a small thing I'm not going to call on resources to enforce it. I may gossip. I'll get back to that in just a moment. But uh, So again, under my definition, the manner in which law is enforced or the agent that enforces law is not determinative of whether or not a, 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 a rule or stipulation is or isn't law. Law is socially imposed constraints and behavior that become embedded in expectations. Under my definition, even rules of grammar are, I would call them, law. Violating a rule of grammar is not very serious at all. We certainly don't call the police, right? We don't call 911. My neighbor's not conjugating the verb correctly. Come out. But, it's something we notice, and there are constraints on human behavior to cause people to, to, in their respective communities, whatever they are, to abide by the law. How would the book case be handled in reality? Let's return to that. I said I'd return to that. So let's pretend I really did want to sit in that chair. And let's, Clarissa, I'm going to make you the bad, well, not bad guy. I'm going to make you the bad girl. All right, can I do that? All right. So the, the, the auditorium... I'm shocked. I'm speaking tonight. It's not, it's not an overflow crowd. <laughs> Must be Monday night football. Um, uh, it, pretend, as I would have to, that the auditorium were full. Right? Oh, and she said, and then Clarissa walks in, and there's no seat except the one with the books. Right? She sees them. She's, ah, ah, and she says, well, to hell with it. Excuse me, to heck with it. Right? That's part of the law. You can't cuss too much when you're giving public addresses. So she sits down. She puts the books on the side. Right? And I come by to sit, and then I say, well, well, what are you doing? And, you, and then you, know, you, 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 assault me, you, you, you assault me with lawyerly talk. You say, well, I'm sitting here. And I say, yeah, but I have my books there. You say, so? And you, again, so you pull out the GMU student handbook. You pull out the, the, you know, the, the, the statutes of the state of Virginia. You pull out the U.S. Uh, 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 code, you pull out every, all, every kind of law book you can imagine, you go through, oh, nothing in here but books reserving a space in a, in a theater. Right. But I insist that you violated the law. I, as I said, in reality, I'm not going to spend that much time on it because it's not a major violation, it doesn't impose a huge cost on me. But, but let's just suppose, to, to go along with the, with the example, let's suppose that I want to press it, which I could do. So how would we resolve this dispute in this case? Right. So Clarissa truly believes, you know, maybe, maybe she's like, you know, she just flew in from, uh, you know, some remote part of the Aleutian Islands where this norm doesn't exist. So she really believes she's right, right? And, and, and I really believe she's wrong and I'm right. So we want to resolve this problem. And we're peaceable people. We're not going to shoot each other or, or, or get in a fist fight. She'd beat me up. Right? And so how will we resolve it? I mean, just 
and, and, and where I'm going with this, you should be able to, this is how human beings tend to, to, to resolve problems, at least in many cases. So we want to resolve the problem. We want to have an objective, uh, dispassionate judge in this case. Right? And so we get to, we're going, to, we're going to choose a judge. Now the first thing is, you know, I'm not going to let you choose your mom or your boyfriend. What? Is that how they do it in the Aleutian Islands? <laughs> as a judge. You're not going to let me choose, um, you know, uh, my son or my ex-wife. Well, you might want to choose my ex-wife. I might, I might, I might. Uh, or my, you know, my brother as a judge. So we want someone who, who we know is not going to be biased toward us. We also want someone who understands what's expected. We want someone who knows, has some sense of the community norms. I mean, the community norms here are you know, the way things are done in Northern Virginia, George Mason. Right? So we, we want someone who's serious and sober and trustworthy, someone who can't be bought. Right? And so, I don't know, Leah, the, 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 who, who introduced, who, introduced uh, the, who started the program off tonight. So we, you know, Leah is well known, she's respected, she's sober, she's judicious. Where are you, Leah? Oh, oh hi, yeah. yeah she, she, I can't see, I mean, this blind, light is blinding. Right? I feel like breaking into a song by Manfred Mann. Right. <laughs> and, and so we call on Leah, and, so, and Leah wants to really sell. She says, so she says, okay, give, give me both sides of your case. Right. So I say, look, here, here, and I explain you know, what, what, what I did, and then Clarissa explains what she did, and we ask you to make a decision. Right. I suspect, if she really wants, given that there's nothing written down, what, what Leah will do, notice I made myself the victor here, what Leah will do is say, well, you know, given the, you, you, Don's right, Clarissa, Clarissa is, is in the wrong. Because the law is the evolved expectation. I was acting consistently with the expectation. Clarissa was acting against it. Notice there's nothing particularly, in this case, nothing particularly obvious about why that rule is beneficial or not. I suppose you, you, you can imagine a world in which that rule didn't exist and it would not be a, a less efficient world or, or a less free world, but that just happens to be the rule. And when a rule gets established as being consistent with expectations, there is a value to maintaining actions along with those expectations. If those expectations are violated, then people don't know how to act in the future. They spend then more resources trying to deal with um, uh, the, the viol you know, the, the, their disrupted expectations. Or, rather than just call on Leah, we might call on a jury of our peers. I'm a big fan, as you may have already surmised, of jury nullification. The original role of the jury in uh, English law making was not to be a finder of fact. And you think about it, that's kind of weird. Why would you get 12 non-experts to find facts? Oh, you know, having someone, having, you know, a, a skilled uh, a coroner, a skilled scientist, you know, one or two, or a panel to find facts is much better than having, you know, 12 randomly chosen people off the street to find facts. In fact, the, the original and I think far better reason for the jury, or at least the function that it served historically, and still to some extent serves, is not so much to find facts, but it is to bring community expectations, to bring community norms into the courtroom. It's jury nullification. I'm quite sure that if a, an adult in Massachusetts who had admitted to having consensual sex with his or her adult partner were in fact charged with a crime and brought before a criminal court, a criminal misdemeanor court in Massachusetts, I'm pretty certain that the jury would manage to find that person not guilty. Some, I'm not sure how they would do it, but they would do it. You just can't get 12 people. It would be very difficult to get 12 people. You have you know, like the 12 most prudish people in Massachusetts. 
it, very difficult to get 12 people to agree to imprison someone for three years, or three, whatever it was, imprison for many time, for doing something that is quite good. Whether you think premarital sex or fornication is good or bad morally, it's, you just know these people were not behaving in any antisocial way at all. And so the jury would, would nullify. It's not to say the jury nullification is always good. The most famous case of jury nullification that, that uh, occurred in the past few decades was, most of you now may be too young to remember, it was the 1995 uh, O.J. Simpson criminal trial in which the jury found O.J. Simpson not guilty. The evidence seemed overwhelmingly to support, as a civil court later found, that O.J. Simpson did in fact uh, kill his wife and, and, and the guy, Ronald Goldman. But for a variety of reasons, the jury didn't want to convict him because of, of, of racial issues. It doesn't always work, just as you know, juries as pure fact finders don't always work. But that was one of the very important functions of the jury, to bring the community norms into the courtroom to make sure or to better ensure that the people charged with violating the law did in fact violate the community, the, 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 the law defined as expectations about how people are supposed to behave, as opposed to violating the, the written uh, uh, or uh, handed down from above declaration from the king or the parliament. And understanding law in this way gives us some insight into the meaning and the, and the sense of the famous uh, uh, aphorism that ignorance of the law is no excuse. If law is the expectations of the community, then most people should know it. It may, it may be true that a particular individual charged with violating the law, in fact, for some odd reason, does, in, does really not know that books serve to reserve a place uh, uh, at a cafeteria table or in an auditorium. But because that expectation is so deep, the reasonable person can be expected to know it, and therefore violating the law is no excuse. And moreover, it's simply, if, if, if ignorance of the law were an excuse, it would be too easy for someone to say, who really did know the law, know the expectation, to say, I had no idea I wasn't supposed to rape my sister, you know? Just none. I won't do it next time. You know, it just, it, just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. So ignorance of the law is, is no excuse. But if you think of law as legislation, how can ignorance of the law not be an excuse if law is defined as legislation? How can, say, ignorance of what is in the new health care bill not be an excuse for someone charged with violating it? I mean, the, literally, the people who voted for it don't know what's in it. The, is, they admitted it. Many of them admitted it. We didn't have time to read it all. We just passed it into law. Well, if, if the people who enact it literally don't know what's in it, everything that's in it, they have some supposition about you know, what it'll do, right? then how can a person, you know, I don't know, a doctor or an insurer or a patient who in fact acts in a way inconsistent with what is written in the bill, how can that person ethically be charged with violating the legislation because he or she truly didn't know what's in it? If legislation, if law were legislation, then ignorance of the law, I think, would be and certainly should be a defense. Law as I conceive it, as that which grows out of the expectations of the community, in that case, ignorance of the law is or should not be an excuse. Um, there are, um, there is in my way of, of viewing law, con conceptualizing law, law is very much like, and this will make sense, at least hopefully, to you econ economics students. If, if not, let me know, because I'll fire whoever your economics professor was, assuming it wasn't me. Uh, law, true law, is very much like market prices. Market prices are not designed by anyone. They sort of emerge from the interactions of buyers and sellers going about their everyday business. 
Obviously, sellers would like prices to be higher, buyers would like prices to be lower, but the market prices emerge, and they serve a useful function about equilibrating markets, keeping things running along in markets smoothly, clearing markets, as economists say. Law is very much like that. It emerges from the everyday actions of ordinary people going about their daily business. Legislators can interfere with that. In the case of prices, they do it frequently when they impose price controls. I grew up in the 1970s as a lamentable decade, in part, in part because of price controls. I very well remember growing up having uh, uh, the government capped the price of oil and gas. It was a very complicated procedure, but basically it kept the price of, of gasoline from rising uh, up to the equilibrium level. It kept the amount of gasoline that people wanted to buy much higher than the quantity of gasoline that people, that suppliers brought to market. And so we had long lines of gasoline stations. We had inability to buy gasoline whenever we wanted. It had ration, you know, all, all sorts of rationing schemes, buying gasoline according to whether or not the last number in your license tag was an even number, an odd number, um, driving around, I remember doing this, driving around, driving around New Orleans where I'm from, looking to see which stations were holding up white flags. That, that, that by the way, was a spontaneously evolved law. The white flags indicated which stations were, it was like the stations were surrendering, right? <laughs> I give up but it actually indicated which stations were open uh, for, for business and, and had gasoline. If it didn't have a white flag up, it didn't have gasoline. And so when legislators interfere with the price setting mechanism, it creates, creates chaos, it creates havoc, it creates disequilibrium. People don't know what to do. It make, makes problems worse than they would be were the price not interfered with. Similarly, when legislators interfere with law, when legislation goes counter to the law, it creates havoc and chaos and problems, very similar to what happens when the legislature interferes in the economy in ways that it shouldn't. I should say, law, law can be codified by legislation. This happens all the time. We say that murder is against the law, right? but it's not against the law because it's written down in a Virginia statute book. Right? The law against murder, the law against theft, the law against arson, the law against armed robbery, the law against fraud, all these laws are in fact codified quite sensibly in the legislative, by the legislature. But that's not why they're illegal. And to, and to see that, just, just suppose by, by some you know, freak set of procedural circumstances, the, the Virginia statute against uh, murder were somehow repealed. Just imagine that. Well, would you then think that, oh, it's off the books. It's perfectly legal now for me to kill whoever I wish to kill. No, you wouldn't do it. Not only would you feel bad doing it, you would know that, say, if you, you know, killed your neighbor because you didn't, you didn't like the way he or she parked her car, right, that you would, have, you would be retaliated against likely by her family, by her friends. Um, it wouldn't be legal just because the legislature got rid of it. So the legislature can codify law. It often does so. But what makes it law is not the codification. What makes it law is the historical evolution of those rules uh, into people's expectations about them. Um, so consider a few cases where the government, in fact, interferes with law, with legislation. Again, one of them is, I just gave you, which is, combines both the economics and the strictly law versus legislation discussion, governments interfering with the price setting capacities of free markets. Another example, the war on drugs. In fact, it is not unlawful. Actually, let me give you a better, it just, just occurred to me, one shouldn't extempor, ex, speak extemporaneously in situations, but let me ask, how many of you are college students? How many of you who are college students under the age of 21? <laughs> Someone knows where I'm going with this. Now, I want an honest answer. Uh, I will not tell on you. How many of you who are college students under the age of 21 have ever consumed, have ever bought or consumed alcohol? Like drink beer, right? You're not supposed to do that, right? 
In fact, it's not illegal for a 20-year-old kid, 20-year-old adult, <laughs> to drink beer. No one really thinks that's wrong. No one really thinks that hurts society in any way. Even worse, and, and, so, and so we don't spend a whole lot of time really going after 20-year-olds who are drinking beer, you know, smuggling their Budweiser and things, taking a sip surreptitiously. <laughs> we do spend more resources fighting the so-called war on drugs for a variety of reasons that I, that, that, that I won't get into, the whole industry uh, that, that whose welfare depends upon fighting the war on drugs, unfortunately. But uh, uh, in fa I'm convinced if there were no statutory prohibitions on marijuana use, take a simple case, on marijuana use, marijuana use would not be considered to be unlawful in any way. In fact, I'm sure among lots of you, it's not really considered to be antisocial. I won't ask, <laughs> but it's possible that someone in this room, at some point in his or her life, has actually encountered uh, a marijuana cigarette. I know, it's shocking, <laughs> but, but possible. But because it's not really against the law, I don't think it really is against the law, how does government enforce it? You know, if, if you're smoking a joint, you're not really hurting anyone, so there's no one to report you. I mean, if, if you murder my sister, I'm gonna report you. If you smoke a joint, I'm not gonna report you, I don't care, right? And so, for the government to enforce that law, it has to do sting operations, it has to, it has to intervene and, and intrude in ways that it doesn't have to when it's, in, when it's enforcing routine, real, or excuse me, not routine, but real law. Real law, in other words, sort of enforces itself not only in that most people just naturally obey it, when, and when it is broken, there it, 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 it causes ordinary people, not necessarily law enforcement officers, it causes law, ordinary people to take actions against that person, either by reporting them to law official law enforcement agents, by doing vigilante, sometimes vigilante uh, enforcement themselves, for minor, for violations of minor laws, like when Clarissa uh, so rudely sat in my See, uh, we don't actually call on a judge to, to determine the outcome, but there are other ways of enforcement. Gossip about her. When I, when I leave, I'll say, you know, that, that, that girl, yeah, her. You know, she, she, sat in my, she sat in my seat with the books. Gossip is a form of law enforcement. Like all forms of law enforcement, it can be abused, but it is a form of law enforcement because it, it, it rep we care about our reputations. And gossip helps to keep people attuned with their, with their um, uh, reputations. These two books, I'll end on this, on this note. These two books here, the ones that I actually used to reserve my seat that you so rudely intruded into are the two most important books that I've read on this topic. The first, as I mentioned earlier, is the first volume of Hayek's Law, Legislation, and Liberty. And again, you can tell by the title, he distinguishes between law and legislation. Uh, and what I said about law here is pretty much a Hayekian definition of law. When I said about legislation, it's largely a Hayekian uh, definition of legislation. You can see it relates to liberty because if people are allowed to be allowed to, to move along with community norms and expectations, those norms and expectations are not impossible, but unlikely to be in the service of any special interest group. Unlike legislation, which, although not always, is often in the service of special interest groups. It is simply not lawful, in my definition, for government to force you to pay a tax when you buy a car produced abroad that you don't have to pay when you buy a car produced here in America. That tariff is designed not to promote any useful end, but is simply a tool of transferring wealth from the pockets of consumers to the pockets of a powerful special interest group, in this case, domestic auto producers and auto workers. There's no way that kind of law, in my conception, high conception, would emerge. The second book, is by 
the late Harold Berman. This is a 1983 publication book called Law and Revolution. Harold Berman was a law professor at Harvard, um, and uh, he, was a, he was a legal historian. And this is a masterful work, and he, it, it, uh, its subtitle is Law and Revolution, the Formation of the Western Legal Tradition. And he looks at the emergence of law in Western Europe from about the, the 11th century through the 15th century. And this is really deep history. And his theory for why the West became more free than the East is that in the West, there were, for a variety of, of historical reasons, there were, these com there were a series of competing sovereigns. And because they were competing sovereigns, no one ever became a true sovereign. You had the church competing against the, pr the crown, the crown and church competing against merchant courts, merchant courts competing against feudal courts, feudal courts and these other courts competing in some cases against urban courts. There were these, these, these cities that had their own uh, sovereignty and people would sometimes flee to them in order to get different jurisdiction. The further east you went in Europe, the less likely it was that you'd have these different competing sovereignties, these different competing uh, 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 jurisdictions. Most importantly, in the east, you had Cesaro Papas in the church and the crown were one, and that gave both the church and the crown huge amounts of power to squash out other purveyors and other sources of law. So Berman's thesis is that because you had all these different jurisdictions, none of them was able to get, get so powerful that they came to dominate life as thoroughly and as deeply as did the state and the church in Eastern Europe and in the Slavic countries. So because of that, Western ideas and Western norms of freedom were able to spring up through these, as one other scholar said, these interstices of, 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 of competing jurisdictions. And so we get the Western legal tradition where law is something that emerges from the ground up and is enforced in, in an ideal sense by the government but is not created by the government. And the, compared to the Eastern tradition, I'm, I'm, it's a summary of a very complex book, but this is basically compared to the Eastern tradition where law is considered to be something handed down from a divinely ordained prince and to violate that law is not only to violate, to violate that, 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 that declaration, is not only to violate a, a secular command allegedly for the benefit of secular society, but to literally to disobey the rule of God. And if people really believe that, it, you know, they're not going to much less likely to disobey it. That kind of overwhelming, powerful, unified sovereignty never existed in the West, and that's why we are free today. So for a, a great deal more um, insight into the idea of law that, that I just threw out at you today, uh, these two books are the place to go. And with that, I will obey the law. I was told to speak between 50 and 60 minutes. I've spoken for about 50 minutes, so I will obey the law, although because Bumper may shoot me if I don't, and I'll take questions. But remember, I can't see you, so speak up so I can. Oh wait! Hey, Bart, do you, did you want to put something on me, or did you want? Did you say you wanted to mic me up, or I'm good? Okay, yeah. Okay, please. Hi. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, my name is Elizabeth, and I'm a Cato intern. I was wondering what your threshold is for uh, a social norm to be considered law under your definition and the Hayek definition, uh, that's, well, I have m multiple parts to my question, but that's the really Well, the let me answer that first part first before you go on. Okay. Uh, I, I don't have a threshold. I mean, I, I, I'm content to define law 
as any uh, evolved social constraint on behavior, recognizing that some of these involve behaviors whose violation is so minor that we don't spend much time or resources enforcing it, whereas others, the violation is very strict. But I'm content to call all of that, all of that law. So clearly, I'm not content to limit the, the, the definition of law to that which happens to be enforced by the state. Do you think this is a desirable definition compared to, say, a natural law definition? I think it, in a way it is a natural law definition. It's not, I mean, nat, the term natural law is one that is, that is uh, uh, surrounded by and suffused with confusion. When some people look at the term natural law, they, they, they think that the term means law handed down by the Almighty. That's not what I mean. That's not what, what at least some of the other natural law scholars that, that I would consider Hayek a natural law scholar in this regard. Na by my way of thinking, law is natural in the same sense that you know, the, the price of milk in a free market is natural. It's not eternal. It's not the will of nature. And nature has no will. It's not the will of the Almighty, but it is the natural result at that moment in time, in that community, of the in interactions of many individuals, and it coordinates their behaviors. And so the law I'm describing, I would call natural law. It, it's natural in the sense that it's, it is the natural product of, of human interactions unaffected by, or at least not very much affected by, uh, artificial interference by people with guns. Professor, your, your definition does not seem to accommodate change in expectations, and I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm the author of a statute in Virginia which says that the federal government may not compel any Virginia resident or citizen to purchase private health insurance. Now, this is supposed to go into effect in three years. There was no behavior at this point. I didn't want that behavior to, to take place. When I looked at the uh, Interstate Commerce Clause, the court cases and the ratification debates, I couldn't see it, but I wanted to prevent it. So how does your definition anticipate efforts to change? Oh, I don't think here, I don't, in the example you gave, I don't think there's any contradiction at all. First of all, I congratulate you. I'm glad you, I'm glad you did that. I, I, I hope it stands up, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think the, you know, the law, the true law is that, you know, people, sh should be allowed to buy health insurance or not, depending upon their own, on their own judgments. And then we had the, le the national legislature barging in with this officious command, the sovereign command, saying, oh, no, 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 now you have, to buy you have to buy health insurance. And so that's precisely why I think it's important to, sti to distinguish verbally between law and legislation, because when you call something law, the, the word law has a certain rightfully so, it has a certain kind of majesty to it. Right? We just can't go around breaking the law as we choose. What the Congress did and what Obama signed is not law at all. It's a, so it's a sovereign command, it's legislation. And I think all you're doing in this case is actually enforcing the law. <laughs> or you're, you're undertaking an effort to, to say, I don't want to put words in your mouth, obviously, but, but as I interpret it from what you just said, you, you have launched an effort to announce to the national government that, look, in Virginia, uh, we want to continue to be governed by the law, which is free people are not forced to buy health insurance. Contract. Right. 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 Uh, and, and, and therefore, we refuse to be bullied by your legislation. The law is superior to legislation, and I think what you're doing is, is helping to enforce that. Right. We, we, it gave standing to Virginia to sue, and that's why I did it. Yeah, yeah well, I, so. I'm, I'm glad you did it. But I don't see it, I, I mean, unless I'm missing something, I don't see that in, at all or in any way inconsistent with my definition 
of law. It doesn't require my definition of law, but I think it's perfectly consistent with it. No, I'm just wondering how, suppose expectations change. Is the evolving understanding, is that now the new law? Yes, I, I, I would say yes, and, and you're exactly right. I mean, I'm anticipating what you have in mind. Just because it's the law does not necessarily mean it's, it's wonderful and good. You can have dysfunctional law. Um, let's pick a case that's a little bit more complicated than history, than the popular history has it. But let's take the popular history story of racial discrimination in the American South. Up until the 1960s, indeed, to, some, to, to a large degree, in many places afterward, it was the law that if you were African American, you were not allowed to sit you know, in certain parts of the theater with, uh, with, 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 with whites, you're not allowed to sit at certain lunch counters, you had to use different drinking fountains. I think we would all regard that as reprehensible, but I would, re I would regard that as having been the law. Now, now again, I, 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 I hasten to add, just because something is the law does not necessarily make it good. And so my definition of the law is something positive rather than negative, although I do think that the kind of law that emerges in society un, unaffected by legislation is generally better and more liberty-oriented than, than, than legislation. But now, uh, uh, to, to, to um, add more richness to the Jim Crow legislation story, in fact, the law up until the 1880s and 1890s was not one of racial segregation. Racial segregation was created by Jim Crow legislation. It turns out that if you, if, and historians have done this, a former colleague of mine here at George Mason, uh, Jenny Roback Morse, uh, Bob Higgs, a great economic historian then at the University of Washington, and some other scholars have looked at the history of the American South in the post-Civil War decades, immediate post-Civil War decades, and what they found was that while there was a lot of demand, while, while, there, while there was some stated expressed preferences among uh, bigoted whites, there's no question that whites back then were, were much more racially prejudiced than they are today, demand for racial segregation of streetcars, restaurants, right, it didn't happen. It just didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen is because it was bad for business. It was bad for business. It was simply too costly for business owners who were, after all, out to make a buck. It was simply too costly for business owners in the vast majority of cases to enforce segregation. Therefore, the segregations had to go to the legislatures in the states and in the, and, and in the local uh, city councils in order to get legislation that commanded people to behave in a racially, to, to, to institute racial segregation. Because there was a, uh, a demand for a lot of people for racial segregation, the enforcement of those statutes wasn't that difficult. It sort of went along with some deep social feelings. But I don't think it's too much of a stretch. In fact, I don't think it's a stretch at all. I think it's quite likely that had the legislature not involved itself in, in uh, uh, those issues, had the legislature not ordered segregation during the Jim Crow era, then what you and I remember, I, you know, from my early childhood, what I, you and I remember in the South as, as racial segregation would likely never have been the case in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. It took legislation to create that kind of law, and hence it took legislation to, to break it. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Thanks for speaking today. Um, I'm coming from uh, the University of Mary Washington, and I'm Scott Drankard. I'm going to preface this question by saying that, yes, I am an Austrian, but no, I am not an anarchist. Uh, so, <laughs> and people keep telling me that it's only a matter of time at this point. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so I wanted to, uh, what I wanted to get at, which is uh, an important part of your argument, is that law is an emergent type thing. Um, 
and that when the state is in its proper place, it reinforces that emergent phenomena. Is there really any need for a state in that instance? I can't believe I'm asking this question. But <laughs> yeah, who says you're not an anarchist? Yeah, exactly. Um, wow, and that's, a, that's actually a, a, a deep question, and I'm not prepared to uh, defend uh, anarchy here. Um, by the way, I, mean, I, won't, I won't give away what, what I am or am not, but I, I, if I were an anarchist, I wouldn't call myself one. Right? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm making a serious point. And that is because even though um, lexicographically the term anarchy is perfectly fine, what it has come to mean, you know, the, the law, <laughs> what the term has come to mean over the past several generations in, in at least American English, uh, it is, is not what it means lexicographic. Lexicographically, it means a world without archons. Archons were the, were in Greek language, the, the, the you know, the, the lawgivers. Uh, uh, what it has come to mean is, is chaos, lawlessness. No one in their right mind supports chaos and lawlessness. And so, for those anarchists among you, I recommend you don't go around calling yourself an anarchist uh, because unless you're among really close friends who know exactly what you mean, so your social norms are different from the broader social norms, if you say, I'm an anarchist, people think, oh, well, you don't believe in any order at all, and anyone with any sense would dismiss you as a nut, right? Because if you really believed in no order and no law, you would, in fact, be a nut or a sadist of some sort. Um, now, is your, your question is, is a state required, I mean, that's your question, is this, do we need a state? What function does it perform if it's just re-solidifying social norms or, like I, I use this argument, I want to better help to, to make it more, more effective. It's really, <laughs> I, 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 no, it's, it, it's, a real, it's a really good question. Um, do you know the name Alfred J. Nock? Yes. Alfred J. Nock, yeah. Uh, Nock was a great writer and, and, and he, I can't remember the term he used, it escapes me. I think he called himself a philosophical anarchist. Um, but Nock pointed out, I mean, he died a long time ago, Nock pointed out that uh, there are certain things that in principle, you know, given our human nature, given the realities of, of the world we live in, that there's no reason why we need a state to do them, but precisely because people's expectations have so, deep, have so deeply evolved to depend upon, or not evolved, but have come to expect the state to perform those things. You can't just get rid of those things overnight. So even if I were a, I don't know, I'll call myself an anarchist just because we're among friends. Even if I were an anarchist, no, I'm not telling you what I am or not, but even if I were an anarchist, right, then there are certain things that I would, would not practically do today, even though I believe we should move in that, in that direction and, and, and hopefully reach that direction. I would not, for example, um, what the hell, what the heck wouldn't I do? <laughs> I, I probably wouldn't, I probably wouldn't disband all municipal police forces today, you know, immediately. Um, because, you know, we're just structured to rely upon the municipality to provide policing. Although I have no doubt, and this is true, I have no doubt that that if we had no municipal police forces, private police forces would emerge and, and in all likelihood perform better overall than, than uh, uh, municipal police forces. Um, and so in a very weird way, my definition of law counsels against um, moving too radically in a l less state-centered direction. Um, oh, that's confusing, isn't it? <laughs> um, what function, I, look, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a guy to defend the state. Uh, <laughs> It, 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 well, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. Look, no, actually, I, I will tell you. I, I, when, I was, when I was young and, 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 and innocent like you, 
I call, I, I call myself a limited government kind of guy. And my study of Hayek, my study of scholars like Bruce Benson, Lon Fuller, look at historical studies of the amazing creativity that people have shown over the years on how to provide public goods. I mean, last year's um, a Nobel Prize, one of last year's Nobel Prize winners in economics, Lynn Ostrom, who spoke here on campus just a few weeks ago, her greatest work is in showing how uh, private individuals uh, on their own without any direction by the state, sometimes actually in contradiction to what the state uh, commands, solve public goods problems that economics textbooks say are impossible to solve unless the state solves them. So my study of things of that sort, and particularly of how law emerged and what law means, did cause me about 15 years ago to begin calling myself a philosophical anarchist or a philosophical no-stater. Uh, it's hard to come up with a good word. I, I, actually, I actually do think that a society without a state is feasible and would be desirable if it emerged, but it would have to emerge. I don't think we could impose it because that would be like a, um, sort of a weird contradiction in terms. So I'm not the guy to ask what, fun what good the state does because it's, it would be a very short answer. <laughs> uh, my name is Andrew Knight. I'm a high school teacher. Uh, I also have a law degree, or by your definition, maybe a legislation, uh, legislation degree. degree. Exactly <laughs> right. Um, first, I thought your examples were brilliant about, first of all, underage drinking. Um, according to my students, it's perfectly lawful by, an, uh, by their own standards. Also, the breaking the speed limit was, I have a, a story to tell you about that. Um, there was a loop around Athens, Georgia, and one day a group of students made a line and went around it at 55 miles an hour just to prove the point that going 55 miles an hour, which was the limit, was ridiculous, and everyone was behind them, and everyone was completely annoyed and Blowing frustrated. The horns, yeah. Exactly right, yeah. yeah. And it was an experiment that they did just to prove it. Oh, well, you were trying to stop them from breaking the law. Uh, yes, exactly they right. They were trying to. They yeah. were trying to make people law-abiding citizens. Right. Yeah. Um, here's my question for you. You said at one point, real law enforces itself, and my concern is this. It's very antisocial, of course, to steal something. So if, if, I, if we, when you weren't looking, I stole your watch and everyone in here saw that, somebody would tell you there would be some sort of social consequence for that. However, how do you explain then rioting and looting and sort of mass breaking of social law? Yeah, may, well, my, 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 it's a good question. My cheap answer is maybe I overspoke. Um, but let me, let, me, let me defend it. I mean. You, you, Again, get back to the earlier point. Just because law is sometimes broken does not mean it's not law. I mean, even on, in the more conventional definition of law that most people accept, law is that which the state declares. It's broken all the time. No one thinks that um, uh, there is no law against murder just because people get murdered from time to time. Right? We all know it's, you know, it just gets broken. And it's unfortunate, but you know, it's still illegal to murder people. It's still a violation of legislation, of the law. Uh, what I meant by law enforcing itself, I didn't, I didn't mean that it just, you know, it, it just automatically works out. I meant something, and I should have been more clear, I meant that it doesn't necessarily, it, it doesn't often, I'll put it, I'll, be, I'll modify myself, it doesn't often require, um, and, and it doesn't often require the conscious use of force for its enforcement. Sometimes it does. Uh, David Friedman has a wonderful book called The Machinery of Freedom in which he imagines what a, or explains, or imagines what a, a society without a government would look like. And in that society, and I don't think this is far-fetched at all, you would have, uh, you know, different private protective agencies. And if, if uh, you uh, violated a rule that my private protective agency agreed to protect me against, uh, and you, you, can, you insisted on violating that rule, ultimately my private protective agency would pull out a gun and aim it at you and say, stop. And if you continued, it would shoot you. Right? So some laws, even on my definition, do need external enforcement. Um, but much more so than legislation, they are self-enforced. Not exclusively, but much more so. 
they are self-enforced. The law, the law uh, against um, I have a good example. I mean, you know, back in the back in the 1880s, the law, in fact, was you know, you know, racially segregate. I mean, it was just too costly to do so. It kind of enforced itself. So you needed legislation to break that law. Did I answer your question? Hmm? One more. Ah, the criminal. Your name was not written on the chair, by the way. No, I know it's not. Um, I'm an undergrad here at George Mason as an econ student, and from what it sounds like, your definition of law kind of morphs with um, society. Very much the same story. And under that uh, premise, where would you see the future of the United States Constitution? And if you know society sort of morphs out of you know some of the tenets of the Constitution. Should we abandon it in the future, according to society? That's a really, really good and really, really complex question. Very, very, very to summarize, the question is, you know, how, how does my story of law fit in with, with the U.S. Constitution? I, I could dodge your question, which I'm not going to, I could dodge it by saying, look, um, the U.S. Constitution is this piece of legislation created by a government, and so it's, you know, like on its face, it's kind of inconsistent with the story I'm trying, I'm trying to tell. Uh, I, I won't do that. I mean, I... As my friend Fred Smith, who's the president of the Competitive Enterprise Institute, says, um, the Constitution ain't perfect, but it's better than what we've got. <laughs> I think it's pretty accurate. Um, and so the question, what, what, what is the Constitution? I mean, one, on one reading, the Constitution is that document that, you know, is the original of which you can, one of the originals of which you can see in the National Archives. You know, but now you can pull up copies of, you know, words of it o o online. Seems pretty clear to me in, in, in most cases. Um, but in fact, in fact, the law in America today, you know, people's expectations, is that the national government has a perfect uh, 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 lawful ability to regulate whatever it wants in your home if it comes up with some, as lawyers say, colorable uh, excuse to do so. And not only, w not only would most judges, not all, but most judges allow the government to do that, even though it violates the facial, the, you know, the explicit words of the Constitution, but most Americans wouldn't bat an eye about it. And so, in fact, constitutional law in America, I would argue, is not. what is written in that document. Yeah, in some ways, it's kind of tethered to it. It evolved from it over the years, maybe. But it, the, the Constitution is not the law. The, the Constitution, as it's written, is not the law of the land. The judges they say it is, but it's not really. I mean, you can't read. You cannot read Article I, Section 8 of the US Constitution, which very clearly says, these are the only powers that the national government may exercise. And they're, you know, few, modified a little bit by, by the amendments, but not much. And you can't read those things. Like, well, you know, it, can, it, can, it can build post, postal roads, right? set up a patent office. Right? The vast majority of what Uncle Sam does today is in violation of Article 1, Section 8. The vast majority of what Uncle Sam does today, some people then say, is, is unconstitutional. A lot of the Tea Party people are saying that. I'm sympathetic with that, but, I, but if I'm going to be consistent with my definition of law, and I think I should be, because I think, it, I think it's the right definition of law, uh, then in fact, the constitutional law in the United States does allow for much more expansive use of federal power than um, uh, is allowed for in any sensible reading of that document. Look, one of the upshots, I'll, I'll conclude with this, one of the upshots of, of, of this view, which I admit is rather radical, uh, of this view of, of law is that ultimately what law is doesn't, it clearly doesn't come from the legislature, it doesn't come from the courts, it comes from the hearts and minds of people. And, and so to create a free society, you don't go to the legislature and you say, please, please treat us like free men and women, or even go to the courts. You, you act like a free 
man or woman. You teach your children to be free men and women. You talk to your neighbors about what it's like to be free men and women. You support organizations like FFF, who, I, Bumper did not ask me to say this, I'm serious. You support organizations like that who get out the message of what it is like to be a free man and a, a woman in a free society. Because only when people start believing and, and knowing what it's like to be a free man and woman and behaving in that way and expecting to be treated that way will people be free. Um, our freedom ultimately, it's kind of, almost kind of mystical, and I don't mean it that way at all, because I, 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 I certainly don't feel like a mystic, but ultimately freedom comes from in here and, and, and how much we all want it in here. If people don't want it, or if too few people want it, we're not going to be free. It's only what we feel in here. You can't, write, you can't spread ink on parchment and protect your freedoms from the natural predations of the many people out there who are willing to, to, to take it away and who can profit by taking it away. So, let's go drink. Thank you. Thank you.